Studies of PTSD as a socially constructed diagnostic category, a view inevitably met with the objection, so, you think PTSD isn't real? In fact, I believe the reality of PTSD to be no less than that assigned it by medical science, but with a realness that now extends into political and cultural spheres. Let's look at the history of the war trauma meme that we've come to know as PTSD. World War I, doctors see soldiers with unexplained tremors, some gone blind or deaf, others mute, some paralyzed. Charles Myers, a British doctor, speculates that their behaviors are due to exploding shells on the front, so he calls it shell shock. But then, soldiers who have yet to see combat appear with similar symptoms. Historian Michael Roth says shell shock in many ways resembled hysteria, but hysteria was a female disorder. <laughs> Doctors, wrote historian Elaine Showalter, were, quote, so prejudiced against the psychological cause that they just kept looking and looking, looking for some kind of wound on the body, evidence of a bomb blast, something physical, anything but psychological. These men were schooled in the tradition of French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot. Charcot thought that hysteria was caused by brain lesions. Autopsies failed to reveal the lesions. Working at the hospital Salpetriere in Paris in the early 1880s, Charcot sketched his patients, posed them as classical figures for photography, and sold the photographs to the public. He turned his lectures at Salpetriere into performances with his hysterical patients, the stars of the show. Sigmund Freud had seen Charcot's work at Salpetriere and thought that the symptoms of hysteria could be a kind of body speak. The reappearance of ideas, fears, memories banished from consciousness. Applied to shell shock veterans, Freud's insight suggested that they had repressed the fear between the, had repressed the conflict between fear and duty. The repressed memories of failure later reemerged as fantasies of the military accomplishments they thought were expected of them. False memories, replete with the physical symptoms attributable to combat. This did not mean that the illness of veterans was not real. Rather, it shifted the diagnostic gaze from causes external to the victim, like exploding shells, to causes that were internal to the mind and emotions of the veterans. What the patient was really afraid of was his own shortcomings. Reviews of shell shock's origins see it cradled in the popular culture of the times. Newspaper stories and, quote, the sympathy and imagination of the public, as historian Martin Stone wrote, overrode all else in the matter of the new disease called shell shock. And just at the camera then knew at Salpetriere had magnetized the attention of doctors on the visual, a new technology played into the medical minds conceptualizing shell shock, the movie camera. It was paralysis that called forth a new diagnostic category. The moving picture camera was just what the doctors ordered. In his 2010 book, Shell Shock Cinema, Weimar Culture and the Wounds of War, Anton Keyes suggests a synergy between early film itself, jumpy with abrupt juxtapositions and silent, and the symptoms it purported to capture, spastic movements, contortions, and muteness. Keyes, accordingly, sees the film, filmic image of World War I veterans as essential in the political culture of interwar Germany. In the 1920 film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, for example, the war veteran Caesar steps from a coffin under the influence of the mysterious doctor. <coughs> Caesar begins to move in a stiff and jump cut motion that resembles the movement later associated with shell shock victims. Films like Caligari use the medical imagery of shell shock to suggest to Germans that the loss of the war had also been a social and cultural shock to their pride and their national identity. Metaphorically, shell shock was the unseen wound carried by veterans and as well in the body politic as the silent disease of national trauma demanding vengeance through more war. In the United States, shell shock became an even more common ailment after the armistice. Elaine Showalter speculates that the rise in post-war symptoms was due to veterans' resentments of the war and political sentiments surrounding the war, a suggestion that veterans' symptoms depended on something more than the war itself. <laughs>
World War II provided a contrasting case. Curiously, observed one doctor, in the Second World War, hysterical symptoms disappeared almost entirely. The absence of shell shock type damage could have been due to the improved practices of doctors. More likely is that World War II would be remembered as the good fight, a righteous cause that was won. Post-World War II American culture was triumphalist. Still more interesting is Eric Lead's psychoanalytic approach to the disappearance of shell shock, its reappearance in the guise of PTSD after the war in Vietnam, and its third act as traumatic brain injury in the next century. The confining and channeling nature of modern society, wrote Lead, required the denial and suppression of libidinal drives. War, he said, provided a field for instinctual liberation. That peace-war binary played out classically in World War II as spasms of violence in the Nazi death camps, the suicidal assaults on Normandy, and the fire and atomic bombings of whole cities. World War I had been different, a slow and grinding affair with an outcome that was unclear and unsatisfying, sort of like Vietnam would be. In the study of war trauma and post-war culture, the war in Vietnam fits better as a type with the First World War than the Second plagued with controversy, lacking a defined objective, and a post-war narrative that displaced the war itself with the figures of emotionally and psychologically damaged men. In Vietnam, U.S. expectations met guerrilla tactics that blurred the lines between friend and foe, combat and non-combat. The murkiness of the war diminished the drive discharge function that it might otherwise have served, leaving the United States feeling profoundly frustrated. Hollywood mostly ignored the war, preferring instead to tell the war at home story in which we see the victim veteran portrayed as criminal, crippled, or crazy. The images of social and psychological wreckage that Americans would come to, under, to understand and remember what the war was about, or to be reminded of by a president on Memorial Day. PTSD, the diagnostic category, was called into being by the American post-war post-Vietnam War experience, its conception conflicted by political and cultural dynamics. The conflict over PTSD's definition was fought in the trenches of the American Psychiatric Association. Flashbacks were the sine qua non of PTSD, but debates over what they were fell along familiar lines, the neurologist versus the Freudians. Psychiatrist Frank Frankel wrote that the lineage of flashback began in literature and film, and that flashbacks were, quote, at least as likely to be the product of imagination as of memory. Veterans politicized and empowered by their wartime experience, something we saw in the, in the slideshow, further complicated the meaning of PTSD. The long-haired veterans in the streets with the protesters, were these real men? Best their image be redrawn. That redrawing began in the summer of 1972 when thousands of Vietnam veterans marched on the Republican National Convention in Miami Beach to protest the renomination of Richard Nixon as president. The New York Times published an op-ed piece at the same time that effectively recast veteran political mobilization as a psychological problem, their activism a form of catharsis. Looking back, PTSD's champion, Haim Shatan, called that opinion piece the turning point for professional interest in war trauma. There was a spate of films from 1968 to 1970 that portrayed Vietnam veterans in political fashion, but from then on, Hollywood overdid itself with crazy vet movies. <laughs> My favorite in that is, is the film uh, uh, where the Goodyear blimp flies over the Super Bowl. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Black, Black, Black Sunday. Black Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the best one. <laughs> yeah, they were crazy for you. <laughs> Bruce Dern. Yeah. So the new DSM-3 in 1980 included PTSD. That changed the narrative, imparting a status upgrade from just crazy to wounded. In turn, the invisible wound could be accepted as a kind of purple heart, evidence of combat experience, even a credential for heroism. Recalling Stone's observation that news and cultural media had expedited shell shock's acceptance during World War I, it's hard to resist the suggestion 
that the science of war trauma had once again been led by forces external to itself. By the mid-1980s, a virtual epidemic of war-related trauma swamped social workers, many wrapping together hard-to-believe war stories with claims of PTSD. A 1983 article in the American Journal of Psychiatry examined five cases whereupon men had presented post-Vietnam War symptoms. Three of, the, three of the men said they were former prisoners of war. In fact, the authors found, quote, none had been prisoners of war. Four of the five had never been in Vietnam, and two had never even been in the military, unquote. Boys having grown to military age by 1990 were, had seen veterans represented as damaged goods and heard the stories of veterans forgotten and spat on. Little surprise then that they went off to war in the Persian Gulf expecting the same and returned symptomatic and feeling neglected. Just weeks ago, the New York Times reported that 255,000 Gulf War veterans have been granted disability benefits despite many of the problems having quote, no clear causes, unquote. As troops departed for Iraq in the spring of 2003, their coming home story was being written. Associated Press reporter Joseph Ferengia asked, quote, how many soldiers will require mental health treatment? <coughs> Why didn't, he ask, if soldiers home from Iraq would be protesting the renomination of George Bush in 2004? Why did he choose the medical framing over a political one? The answer, I think, is that the PTSD storyline had achieved hegemonic status. To think outside that box was to risk ridicule, perhaps even political or professional rebuke. Why do you hate our veterans? By 2005, a wave of PTSD news reports was washing over the country. That storyline gained density and purity when blended with traumatic brain injury. And TB, TBI's passage into professional use was like PTSD's and shell shock before it, mediated by news stories and popular culture. In Iraq, ABC newsman Bob Woodward was injured by an improvised explosive device in January 2006. The story got major news coverage, but no mention was made of TBI until 13 months later when a press conference promoted an ABC documentary based on a new book written by Woodruff and his wife, Lee. Entitled In an Instant, the book underscores the weight of the PTSD TBI narrative value relative to their diagnostic value. Like any real combat veteran, Woodruff's worst wounds were on the inside, unseen. That narrative value can be weighed by comparing the number of TBI stories in the news before and after the press conference. Before the press conference, there had never been a news story about TBI as a war injury. In the month after, 11 stories covered TBI, with nine of those connecting the diagnosis with war veterans. The most important of the nine was Paul Eaton's New York Times op-ed. Eaton, a retired Army Major General, declared TBI to be, quote, the signature malady of the Iraq War. The signature malady by a declaration of a retired general, not a doctor, and despite having almost no association with war, with war veterans prior to the ABC program. By the end of April, the Woodruff's book had bumped Barack Obama's autobiography, <coughs> The Audacity of Hope, from the New York Times number one bestseller spot. Professional interest in war caused TBI also exploded after the Woodruff media blitz with 12 journal articles in 2008 and 50 more since. I, that was a count of a few months back. In April 2007, Washington Post reporter Ronald Glazer declared, quote, Iraq has brought back one of the worst afflictions of World War I, shell shock. The brain of soldiers is truly shocked, unquote. Glazer continued drawing a distinction between a highway accident and an IED explosion. Quote, TBIs from Iraq are different. Something else in Iraq is going on. Even a gentle parsing of Glazer's words, TBIs from Iraq are different, points to the meaning of TBI being at least as much derived from the socio-cultural context of the war as from anything diagnostic, as, this, as if the same event happening in Indiana 
would not cause TBI or a different kind of TBI. I'm skeptical. In the first place, an accurate analogy to World War I shell shock undercuts that case. And my skepticism has some good company. In a 2009 New England Journal of Medicine article, Dr. Charles Hogue wrote, quote, psychological factors, compensation and litigation, and for me it's important, patients' expectations are strong predictors of TBI symptoms, unquote. The deconstruction of war trauma nomenclature reveals it to be a stew of ingredients gathered from popular culture, political agenda, medical technology, the folk mystique of things unseen, like wounds, and the science that stirs the stew. Iraq and Afghanistan were even more ambiguous than Vietnam, making combat and valor even harder to define. With wounds making heroes and invisible wounds countable, anyone who deployed could have a hero-eligible story. And the nation's foundational sense of itself as a besieged people sacrificing for the defense of good, capital G, could be affirmed. There's a danger in that. We know that Anton Keyes is right. The invisible wound, in, enlivened by images of shell-shocked World War I veterans, led Germany back into war and its destruction in World War II. Enlivened by its images of PTSD-stricken veterans, the U.S. sought collective remedy for its Vietnam syndrome in its Gulf War slaughter of retreating Iraqis, a slaughter abetted by a U.S. presence in Saudi Arabia that supercharged the jihadi movement right into the World Trade Center. The disparaged Vietnam veterans invoked by President Obama are mythical. Their image sustained by the legend of spat upon veterans, the fantasy of a treasonous movie star, and the mystique of invisible wounds. There's danger in that. Myths are group stories. Stories as real as the people who tell them. As real as the group, the nation, that the stories create. The nation bonded by its commitments to avenge its hurts and unable to distinguish hurts inflicted by self and other is a danger to all. 